Hey, I'm Stephanie Rubitz. Today we are talking about hand stitched buttonholes. Mm. Okay, now last week I did say that this was like that the inner workings of the coat were done, but I, it, I actually it wasn't because I still had to do my chain tacks in the underarms to hold the lining from slipping around too much. Um, so I have a whole thing, like a, a thing planned for February on my channel, which means I'm gonna have to put that video in March. Um, if you have been following along, I know some of you were making coats at the same time. If that's the case and you wanna know about chain tacks, I will link another video where I do a chain tack um, below, but I am still gonna do this other video because I feel like in the other video, the chain tack is just like one tiny part of it and it's kind of buried in the video. And I want people to be able to find it in search. So I'm still gonna do a dedicated video if you're finding this video, like if you're watching this later on after this series is complete, then that video will be part of the playlist and you don't gotta worry about it. So yeah, don't forget your chain tags. They're important. But back to the buttons. Okay, why, why? Why would somebody wanna hand stitch a buttonhole? Well, there's a few reasons. One, it is kind of part of the whole like bespoke haute couture kind of tailoriness of some garments. So if that's something that you're going for, maybe you wanna try a hand stitch buttonhole. But also, you know what, if you're doing something like I just sewed a really beautiful wool coat and you know what, if you're somebody who puts a ton of time and effort into something like that and putting your like garment that you toiled away for hours and hours into your buttonholer makes you like lose your mind a little bit, like gives you an anxiety attack, a panic attack because it's so stressful, hey, maybe you want to try a hand sewn buttonhole. Originally for this garment, I wanted to do actual tailored buttonholes, um, but the like the the weave of this tweed was really quite loose, and I just didn't think that that fabric would work really well for a tailored buttonhole. So I thought, hey, I'm gonna give the hand stitch buttonhole a go. So today I'm going to show you the basic process of doing a hand stitch buttonhole with gimp, which is sort of like the filler in the buttonhole to kind of give it a nice plumpness. I guess. And I'm going to show you all of the things that I learned, the little tips and tricks that um, some I looked at, some just kind of made sense to me, and I'm going to show you how it went for me because this is this was a new thing for me, but it's pretty fun. All right, so here's my coat. Uh, my lining is all in, my hem is done, everything is looking gorgeous. I still have all of my pad stitching um, in the front on both sides. And these are the buttons that I'm gonna use. I'll be honest, I wasn't too fussy on them, but I wasn't like a lot I could find. The first thing I needed to do was measure my button. So I, this is a uh, post button, so I am gonna measure as best I can through the center, um, but it's hard to get the ruler kind of right on the center. Now to do the buttonholes, I'm going to be using this number 24 silk thread. It's important to use silk because it's so much stronger than cotton and will not wear and tear the way cotton thread or even polyester will. The next thing I'm going to use is called GIMP. Now this has a poly core and it is wrapped in silk as well. Yes, it is green because it was either that or like fluorescent orange. You know, just there wasn't much options for me <laughs> unless I wanted to order and wait for months. So hopefully I can cover this really well. And my comically large chunk of beeswax, I can't find my small chunk of beeswax. So this is like what I have around for making lotions and candles and stuff. But listen, any thread conditioner you have is totally fine. I just prefer beeswax because I keep it around for other things. If you are gonna use beeswax, you need to heat your thread up so that the beeswax can really kind of sink into the thread. I'm also just using some regular like sew all thread to do my um, overcast stitching and I'll use a contrasting one to do all my basting stitches. All right, so here is my little sample piece here. I just, I'm gonna do it on this because I thought it would be so much easier than trying to see me doing it with black thread on a black coat. Okay, listen, I really don't know what I was thinking, but I kind of made like a really big blunder here and I marked out the buttonhole in Sharpie, which means I can't remove that mark later. 
And then I didn't really think about that until I got to the end and went to show off the final product and there's big ugly sharpie marks like sticking out from it. So, um, sorry. <laughs> I was not thinking. Okay, so before we get started here, I'm working um, as though the edge that I'm working on right now is like the opening edge of the coat, okay? And I'm just putting in a couple of quick glue stitches to hold my thread in. I'm not tying a knot because these are my basting threads and I want to be able to pull them out later. And so here I am going to baste down to the buttonhole, around the buttonhole, and then carry on basting down that edge of the fabric. And so if I was doing multiple buttonholes here, I would end up with basting between each buttonhole. You really want to hold all of your layers of fabric really tight together here because things can shift around on you and you'll want to pull out your hair. So take the time, do the basting stitches, do not skip this. You will thank yourself later, I promise. All right, now I'm going to do my next set of basting stitches. These ones are permanent. Um, and basically I'm going to outline where I want my stitch lines for my buttonholes to be. And I'm going to start this thread a little ways away from the buttonhole and I'm just going to run it in between the layers of fabric until I get to where my buttonhole is and then I'll poke it out. This is just because you really don't want to make a knot here because you want this work that you're doing to be hidden. So we don't make a knot but we just sort of bury our thread in and leave a little tail hanging out for now. I'm going to cut that off later. So don't worry about it. Now that my thread is in there, I'm just going to use a back stitch and I'm going to go all the way around my whole buttonhole. Now I'm just going to do like a, a regular plain old buttonhole here. If you wanted to do a keyhole buttonhole, go right ahead, but you do need to cut out a circle on one end if you go that route. Um, so you can use a hole punch or if you're really careful with scissors, you could probably do it. I don't know if I would trust myself to make multiple holes uniform that way, but hey, you do you. I just wanted to keep it simple for my first set. Although I'm doing a really good job at knotting my thread up. <laughs> so here's a close up of all the basting stitches. You can see my back stitching all the way around where my buttonhole stitches are actually gonna go. And you can see my big basting stitches that are holding the rest of the fabric kind of all together. So between these two sets of basting stitches, all of my fabric is super secure um, and I know that it's not going to shift because as you're doing your buttonhole, you have to move your fabric, right? So you need to make sure that everything is going to be held together really, really well. Now I'm going to fold that in half and I'm going to grab my scissors and cut that open. Then I am going to cut either side right up to the stitch line that I made with my small basting stitches. Make sure you don't cut past that. So when I was looking at, I, I looked at a ton of different like blog and internet resources and stuff like that to figure out how to do this. And the popular way of putting your gimp into your buttonhole stitch is to do all of your prep stitches, like all of your basting, all of your overlocking, all of that. And then when you go to actually do your buttonhole stitch, just hold the gimp in there and then do your stitch around it. I actually just thought it would be easier and it worked out great to put my gimp into my overlock stitch. Um, and then my gimp was already held into place and I could just focus on those buttonhole stitches. I wasn't having to hold anything anywhere. It was just in there. The only like difference is when you go to do your bar tack, you have to hold the gimp out of the way, but it was like really a non-issue. All right, so here you can see my buttonhole is overcast and my gimp is all locked and loaded in there. All right, so now I have my needle threaded with my waxed silk twist. And I'm gonna start my thread the same way I did with my regular thread. I'm going to start it a little ways away from my buttonhole, bury it in between the layers of fabric, and I'm not going to knot it. I have my thread coming out right at the base of my gimp and I'm just holding that gimp out of the way. All right, now I am going to make, mm, I think I did three, you could do three or four, depending on how thick your gimp is and how thick your thread is. I'm gonna make uh, three just looped stitches for my bar tack. 
and I'm just going to make them one over another, over another, over another. Okay, this is the bar tack that is going to fill in that space where there will be no gimp when we cut those gimp ends off. Once you have your bar tack made, you now have to take your thread and essentially just wrap it around the bar tack. So I'm not putting my needle through the fabric here, I'm just going around that bar tack. And that's going to hold all of those bar tack threads together, and that's just going to help the bar tack match the thickness of the gimp. And there we go, we can sort of see the bar tack. We could see it better if I hadn't used a sharpie to mark my buttonhole, but I mean, we all make mistakes. When you are running your thread around the bar tack, that's literally all you're doing. Don't feel like you have to do the buttonhole stitch now. You will be doing that buttonhole stitch around the bar tack later. Right now, the purpose of the bar tack is to take the place of the gimp on the end because eventually as you get around with your buttonhole stitch, you're gonna trim that gimp. And so this is kind of like to fill in the space between the two gimp ends. So you don't have to buttonhole stitch it yet. Just wrap that thread around. All right, now that that bar tack is done, we can let the gimp ends go and we're just gonna let them hang out until we're done our whole buttonhole. Don't trim them ahead of time just in case your gimp shifts or something and then you wind up with it too short and then you have to redo everything. It would suck. So, my needle is still threaded with the silk from the bar tack. And I'm working right-handed, so I'm going from right to left. And I want my thread to always be on the right hand of my work. I don't want it to cross in front of my work when I'm moving to the left, so it's just something to keep in mind. Keep your, your thread tail behind you. Now I'm going to put my needle in through the hole, and then I'm going to bring it back out at that line that I stitched earlier, that tiny basting line of the back stitches. That's gonna be my line for my buttonhole. With my needle still through the fabric, I'm going to take the thread coming out the eye of the needle and I'm going to wrap it around my needle. So I'm working right to left, I'm wrapping that clockwise. And then I'm going to pull my needle out. That makes the knot. Now, really wherever the knot goes is up to you. I'm having my knots on the outside because I saw somebody do it on the internet and I thought it looked cool. A lot of knots are on the inside, but I am going to make sure that I keep pulling my thread to the outside as I'm moving along. If I pull my thread any other direction, that's where the knot is going to be. So however, wherever you want your knot to be, it's cool. Just pick one and stick with it and make sure that you're always pulling your threads that direction. So again, to show you, put my needle in, wrap my thread around, pull my thread out. And that's pretty much all there is to it. Okay, now as you're doing your stitches, you may see like little spaces. Maybe you're like me and you couldn't get gimp that was the right color and you can see it kind of the color poking through between your stitches. Resist, resist the urge to go back and throw in another stitch, okay? Do not do it because the whole thing about the buttonhole stitch is you have sort of like these like little micro loops from knot to knot to knot to knot and you're gonna mess that up if you go back. I will show you how to fill those spots in in a minute. Um, so right now, just, just be okay with them. Okay, so I've worked one whole side of the buttonhole now and I'm, I've come to the end. Now whether you have a keyhole buttonhole or a regular buttonhole, it doesn't matter, you work it the same way. It might seem logical to think you need to space out or fan out the stitches more, um, but what I found is I wanted to keep my stitches as tight as I had around the rest of the buttonhole, and that way I would have good coverage all the way around. What happened was I just had my stitches stack up a little bit on the inside of the buttonhole, but it had a nice silky finish and it didn't make the buttonhole so much smaller that my button didn't come through anymore. All right, so I've completed all the stitches around the buttonhole, with the exception of the end that I started at. So now I'm at this bar tack that we made and I'm just going to trim the ends of my gimp out of the way so that they are sitting flush against that bar tack. Now I can continue on with the stitches that I've done all the way around and I can do those same knots on the bar tack. 
This whole time I've been turning my work as I'm using it. I found that really beneficial for keeping my stitches uniform um, so that I was always executing my stitch in the same way every time. So don't be afraid to keep that work moving around rather than trying to make yourself do stitches in different directions as you work the buttonhole. Okay, here we are. We are at the end of this. So I'm going to take my needle and I'm going to place it into the first knot between my first two stitches. And that is going to connect my row of knots so you can't see where I started the buttonhole and where I ended the buttonhole. Now is the moment when we can go back and fill in any spaces. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run my needle through my buttonhole so that my thread continues to be buried within the buttonhole and I'm going to just run it to a spot where I have a bit of a bald patch. I'm going to bring that needle up, keeping the thread captured within the threads of the buttonhole right on the inside edge of the buttonhole. Then I'm going to put my needle back down right before the knots. And in so doing, I'm able to fill in any little bald patches that I have where my gimp is showing through. Before we sign off today, I'm going to give you uh, a look at the completed garment. There were a few things that I did to the pattern if you've been following this whole series. Um, so the pattern was supposed to have separate pieces for the bodice and the lower part and have a seam in the middle. I didn't like that. So um, I ended up like overlapping my pattern pieces, the amount of the seam allowance, and just cutting them as one piece. That's really a do you have enough fabric to do this kind of a thing because you get a bit more wastage. Um, but fortunately I had enough fabric so I was able to do it that way. I also uh, did a spla uh, splash, a splash. I also did a slash and spread to get more of an A-line to the coat just so that it had a little bit more flowiness. So um, the pattern is really not, I mean, <laughs> The pattern I started with is nothing like what I ended up with. But here is a look at my new winter coat. I absolutely love this coat. I love the swing to it. I love the A-line. I love how warm it is. Um, I used actually a fairly thick fabric for the lining as well, just so that I could avoid an interlining. And it was, it's so warm. It is so warm. It is really going to help me on our Canadian winters and my 7 a.m. walks. I am just thrilled with it. Um, and I hope that you like it too. Alright, so that was my adventures in buttonhole making. <laughs> they were really fun. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm happy that it's a thing I tried. I think I'll probably, it'll be something that I practice a little bit more before I do it again, but it was a super fun project. And after all of the handwork that I did on this coat, I'm actually really happy to have finished it off with another hand stitch that I can actually see. Because all of that pad stitching I did was gorgeous and you can't see it. <laughs> and I just, I'm kind of bummed out. I'm a little bummed out, I'm not gonna lie. That's all I have for you today. I am so grateful that you followed me on this journey of making my first wool coat. I learned so much and I hope that you did too. And it's just been such a fun product, product, project. I cannot not with the talking today. So thank you so much for joining me and I will see you next week for something totally different. Big plans for February. <laughs> <laughs>